Hello, I'm Emma Bruner at Discovery Park of America, and this episode of Real Foot Forward is sponsored by ATA. Visit atacpa.net to learn more about the services they offer for individuals and organizations. ATA, your long-term accounting partner. Today's guest is Lynn Brassfield, award-winning educator from Dresden, Tennessee. This is Scott Williams, the host of Real Foot Forward, where every single week we cover the history, the accomplishments, and the people of our home here in West Tennessee. And today I am so excited to have um, an incredible educator on the show, Lynn Brassfield. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you. So, Lynn, um, back me up a little bit and tell me um, where are you from, um, what did your parents do? Tell me a little bit about your childhood. Well, I grew up in um, Rutherford, Tennessee. Uh, both of my parents are deceased, but uh, I came from a loving family of uh, five siblings. And uh, um, my dad was a hard worker. He is still the work ethics that I have in me today. And my mom was a disciplinarian. So she is still the morals in me that I have today. And so uh, they were great parents, very supportive. And what kind of a student were you? I was, I've always been an intrinsic learner. I love learning. Even during the summers while I'm off, I'm trying to get into workshops at UTM, as many as I can get in. But I've always been uh, an intrinsic learner, a person that loved to learn. And that's what I tried to instill in my students uh, in my classroom from year what, to year. What did, your, uh, what did your parents do for a living? My dad was a sharecropper. Um, uh, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. My dad, um, after sharecropping, he uh, worked on as a mechanic on, in a laundromat, working on the machines to keep them uh, working. Um, but in my early childhood, my dad was a sharecropper. We picked cotton, uh, and then we lived in a house that uh, that was owned, uh, not by us, but by the man that he uh, worked for. And so um, we picked strawberries. We did, we did just, just, a, just a little bit of everything <laughs> back then. <laughs> well, and from what I've been told, my parents have told me about picking cotton. Mm -hmm. um, and it cuts your fingers and it's not, oh. not fun. It does, it does. Well, we picked the cotton, then when all the cotton was picked, they used to call it pulling bows, the cotton bows. We'll pull those for the man that we, we that my dad worked for. So yes, it would just we we had to wear gloves then, and so mm -hmm. yes, it was it was hard work dragging those cotton sacks. <laughs> it was it was hard work. And what was your school like? My school, I attended an all black two room school in China Grove. That's in Rutherford, Tennessee. Um, the school is still there today, but it's not a school anymore. They turn it into some kind of community center. Um, and sometimes when I feel the need to go home for my roots to where I came from, I'll just uh, get in my car and I'll drive out that way where I grew up and, and grew to school. But it was a two-room school. Didn't have indoor plumbing. Didn't have an indoor bathroom. Um, We'd have to go to an outhouse <laughs> to use the bathroom, and then we they work we were clean though because I remember them lining us up at the water pump to wash our hands before we got ready to eat. Wow. No cafeteria, nothing like that. And so um, those are kind of my roots as far as elementary school, early elementary. And then I was bused to Dyer. I don't know if you know where Dyer, Tennessee, is. Sure, yeah, I absolutely. was bused to a middle school there in Dyer. It was an all-black school as well. And um, we did have indoor plumbing, though, <laughs> and we did have um, uh, bathrooms and, and, uh, and things like that. But back to China Grove Elementary School, we didn't have even a lunchroom. My mom would and dad would bring our lunch out to the school. And um, if you didn't bring your lunch, then there was a little man that there was a man that drove a, a, a truck filled with all kind of goodies, candy, coats and 
uh, crackers and he would come out there and park. And the students that didn't bring their lunch, they could buy uh, their lunch from that truck. We used to call it the hootie wagon. <laughs> and they were Mr. Pete. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Yes. How, how far away was that from your house, did you say? Uh, it was, um, it's about maybe a mile or so. Because we, we, we lived in the country. Yeah, we, we lived in the rural area. So they could bring our lunch to us. And, and it wasn't very far. And then um, you uh, went all the way through. Uh, where did you end up going to high school? That's when I was, we were bused to Rutherford High School. That's when right. integration start. Integration started and started in, um, I remember my first, first day of starting the Rutherford High School, I was so, so afraid because I had never had white teachers before. And I guess the teachers were kind of apprehensive as well because they had never taught black students before. And so, um, but uh, good experiences came from there because that's where I got my inspiration to do what I love doing most of all. And, and it's my passion today and that's, that's teaching. So you, so you, um, did, were you, did you go as a freshman? As a freshman, yes. And so because we could, how, how far in advance did you know that you were going to be going, you know, one of the first people to go to this integrated high school? Uh, the memory is kind of fuzzy. I don't know how far in advance. I'm sure my parents talked it over yeah. because um, my older sister, she was um, she was high school. She was 12th grade. Well, she was she was going into the 12th grade, I think. I'm not sure. I can't remember. Yes, I'm pretty sure. But she was older than I was. And show, so she had the opportunity. I remember them discussing her going to Trenton Rosenwall High School. It was all black high school. Um, but I guess they decided to keep us all together. So they sent all of us to Rutherford High School. And do you remember the morning you got up and were getting ready to go? Oh, it was. It, I was so nervous so nervous because I didn't know what to expect. Didn't know if we would be, how we would, we would be accepted um, at Rutherford High School, but the teachers turned out to be really, really nice because their main concern, which is my main concern today, is um, educating students and helping students to learn. So they were, that was their um, main goal or objective as well. And so you felt, did you feel comfortable when you, when you went in there that day and not oh. knowing when you left that first day, did you, were you relieved or was, was everybody nice to you or what was your experience? Well, no, everybody wasn't nice um, as far as the, because it was a new experience for um, not only the, the blacks, but the whites as, as well. So some were nice, some were kind of apprehensive about um, us coming to their school and, and we were apprehensive but well about us going to uh, their school and so it was just a lot of mixed emotions but I do remember being so afraid um, the first day of school because I didn't know what to expect. Of course I mean that's in such a moment in history um, of course you were you know young and couldn't comprehend you know what a big part of history that that was um, your years there. So you would, did you go to all four years of high school there? I did go to all four years. I graduated in 1970 from Rutherford high school. And when you look back, uh, you know, do you look back, was it a positive experience overall? Oh, so much, so much of a, a positive uh, experience because it made me the teacher uh, that I am today. Mr. Halliburton, I remember him, he taught chemistry. And I remember him, uh, one day we were working in his lab and he was working with me and, because I'm a family oriented person and we're all a, a tight knit family. And I remember him uh, showing me something about the project that we were working on. And he, was, he said, you know what, Lynn? And I said, uh, yes, Mr. Halliburton, he says, your parents or your mom and dad raised some really good kids. And that meant a lot to me. It meant so much to me to hear that. And so he is the inspiration uh, for what I'm doing today and that passion that I have to teach 
students and I pass that passion along in my classroom every day, every day. On my wall at school, when you first walk into my students first walk into, walk into the classroom I have, uh, teach to the heart and then the mind will follow. So my objective is not only to teach my students at Dresden Middle School, but to show them that I care and that I love each and every one of them. So Mr. Halliburton, the seeds that he planted, you know, without him knowing it, um, were going to grow for generations to come. Yes, yes. So and, and, and they did. You, you were uh, in high school, and like everybody in high school, you're trying to figure out uh, what's, next, what's the next chapter. Uh, did you know from that point, did you already know when you went to college that you wanted to be an educator? I already knew it. I already knew it. Wow. There was no thinking about it. No, I already knew it. That's what where, I wanted did you, to where did you go? The University of Tennessee at Martin. I um, graduated um, in 1998 with my bachelor's and um, I graduated with my master's in plus 30 in 2003. And then I just graduated from Arkansas State University with my EDS this past August. Wow, well congratulations. That's amazing. Thank you. I'm an intrinsic learner. <laughs> I just have to <laughs> keep keep learning and learn everything that I can. You really are. That's amazing. Um so um you you started, uh you graduated. Where was your first where was your first school that you taught at? My first school was um Dresden Middle School. Uh, Mr. Jeff Kelly, he hired me in in 1999, and that uh, began my teaching year. Um, and ever since then, I've been at Dresden Middle School. I haven't taught anywhere else, but I can't imagine um, a better school to teach. Well, and you, I mean, obviously, you're, uh, you've been awarded many, many, many teaching awards um, and have been held up as, you know, a, a great teacher. So I know the kids that uh, have uh, been able to be in your class, you know, really appreciate that, as do the parents. As a parent myself, mm -hmm. I know how, how important that is. Um, what are, what are um, some of the tips on teaching that you can share with us? Obviously, a lot of parents gained a new appreciation for educators as they began trying to teach from home. Um, what are some of the things that you found uh, have been great ways to educate young people? Um, I think the, the first thing that a teacher or an educator has to establish, have to establish a rapport with the students. Um, and so the first day of school, before I even meet my students, we go to the gym and we get them and then we bring them back to our classroom. They don't enter my classroom. Until I have the song by Bill Withers, Lean On Me, playing. And I tell them that's going to be our class song. You can lean on me anytime. And um, it'll be two times of the year I, I, that I, I lean on you in the classroom every day, but there's going to be it. at least two times of the year they're going to be leaning on you, and that's TCAP time. <laughs> and um, during the TCAP writing assessment, but I lean on you every day. And so, um, I want them to enjoy the classroom, have fun learning, but uh, but I establish that rapport with my students first. That's the first thing that I do. Okay. I bond with my students. They have nicknames if they want them. They don't have to have them, but that bonds with, with my students even more. I have students, um, uh, their nicknames are... Uh, AKA Lucky, they call me Miss B. <laughs> uh, and then Lucky, uh, uh, Football FB20, which is Football 20, and they just have, just if they want them, I don't push them on them, but if they want those nicknames, uh, that just, oh, that just bonds those students with, I, just, it just bonds our class. We become a community uh, and we kind of look out for each other. And so that's the first thing that I do with my students is establish, establish that rapport with them to show them that I care. And then the second thing is to uh, 
set high expectations for my students because I don't want them to perform at just a level, but I want at a normal level, I want them to enjoy the classroom, perform. I have in my classroom, I have this, it's a, like a plasma ball. It, you touch it in electricity. Have you seen those? Oh, it's, yes. Yeah. And so here's what I do. <laughs> I'll say, I'm sending you good energy to do great work today. Everybody jump up, go back there and touch that electricity ball and they'll go back there and touch that plasma ball and then they'll come back and then we're ready to, to get class started. So it's just a lot of different things that I incorporate into my classroom and I welcome uh, parents, uh, their uh, input into what we're doing in the classroom. They do articles of the week where um, for extra credit, I get a parent, they get a parent reflection over that article that we studied and um, a parent signature, and that's their extra credit. Um, as a matter of fact, before the coronavirus got this, <laughs> um, this, um, this pandemic, we, uh, they chose a coronavirus article of the week from the Kelly Gallagher website. They chose one, and it says, the coronavirus, how worried should you be? And so they highlighted and they annotated. We discussed it. We talked about it. And so they were already familiar with the coronavirus, but not to the severity of what it is today. So, yeah, that's so just getting parents involved in the classroom as well. Well, and that was going to be um, something I was going to ask about um, is how do you. Um, well, first, before we talk about that, I want to talk about, you know, and I don't know a lot about your school, so I don't know um, how many uh, young people are on the free lunch program or, mm -hmm. you know, how much uh, poverty there is in that community. Mm -hmm. But um, I know in every school there are students that are struggling. Um, how do you spot those students that need some extra help, you know, because of their home life or because of not having enough to eat? Well, you can. Well, we have the the free breakfast every morning if students need uh, or need um, to eat breakfast to get their day started. Um, as far as in the classroom, um, students, if if they're struggling, uh, I just because I'm one on one with those students and um, I have that rapport with those students. I know which students are are having problems as far as need the extra help from me and so I just just get with those students and try to give them all the help and support that I need and uh, that they need and if the parents uh, need my support I offer that support as well so it just you just uh, as a teacher you just know which students you know that need that extra help and yeah. in the classroom because you know your students so you you mentioned a little bit about uh, COVID-19 and how you worked with them on articles. Um, how, how would you suggest parents who are, you know, working with their children at home right now, um, how do they talk to their kids about what's going on like with COVID-19 or also with, with George Floyd and with the riots that are going on and the protests and, and with his murder to begin with? How, how do you introduce uh, concepts of uh, racial equality and, mm -hmm. and racism and all these big, difficult, challenging topics? How do you talk to kids about those kind of things? Well, I think the, uh, the I would first choose, um, maybe let them choose an article of the week that deals with uh, just like the coronavirus or um, maybe uh, just teach a, a lesson on um, uh, on racism. And my students in the classroom, they do, they have done um, uh, writing assignments on um, racism. I know we did an argumentative essay where the topic, I gave them the topic, um, it says, um, do you think racism will ever end? Uh, is there still racism and do you think racism will ever end and they some say yes some say no so we have debates in the classroom where we get up and discuss uh those issues and let them voice their opinions i know we had a debate in the classroom and this one student this is with my eighth graders uh this one student says 
no racism it'll end it'll it'll it won't it won't be racism all the time and because parents um will teach their children that uh hey this is not the way that you should feel about a person of a different color and then some the majority he, he was standing alone on his side of the room and then all the other 23 were on the other side no it won't ever end so they kind of voice um, their uh, opinions, talk about it, discuss uh, the issues at hand, and, and we just have discussions in the classroom. And I usually uh, introduce those with pieces of literature or maybe through music or songs, just like the, the integra integration. Um, I um, started out with a vocabulary uh, video about Ruby Bridges. And uh, we talked about that and discussed that. And then I asked him to close your eyes. And, and I said, I want you to imagine me as Ruby Bridges, but I'm not six years old. I am a freshman starting an all white high school. And then that's where we got our discussions going on that uh, about integration. And they know I, I taught, I was taught in a, Two room classroom. They were like, "Ah, oh, oh wow, Miss B, how did you feel? Why didn't you Why didn't you just move?" And I said, "Well, we couldn't move. We couldn't afford to move. We we my dad worked for the place where we lived. Um, he worked for a sharecropper, and that's how we we got our most of our food, and uh, that's how we got the place that we live. So we just couldn't up and move anywhere. We couldn't." And they were just in awe of how, but students love hearing about the teacher or hearing about you. So you have to share, I feel like I have to share my life with them. Um, I share with them how um, difficult it is if you uh, maybe start um, at a university and you drop out, how hard it is to go back, because that happens, <laughs> that happened to me. I fell in love. Then I was out two years. Oh, my passion is teach. I have to get back to that. And so um, it was very difficult because I had a home then. I didn't have any children, but I had a home and a husband. So I had to, uh, it, it took a lot of determination, effort to get to back, get to where I am today and doing something that I really love. I couldn't, and I just, I just hate that I miss uh, that opportunity. I, I wish I could have been teaching sooner. Um, so it sounds like you, the students in your class, when they're talking about uh, racism and uh, integration, that they have like an example of somebody who's actually from history can te can tell them about it. So that's yes, great. yes. Um, I know that you and I have a mutual friend in Karen Campbell. We um, do. <laughs> she recently wrote a really interesting article about about you. How did that come about? Well. Um there was another teacher at our school <laughs> and um, she told my principal about where I came from, uh, how I was bused to an all white school and my experience. And my principal came to me and said, well, uh, Karen Campbell would love to do an article <laughs> about coming to your classroom and see you teach a lesson. And of course it was black history month. And so, I said, sure, sure, that would be fine. So I got back with her and she um, she was welcome to my classroom. She got to know all the kids and I do incorporate music in my classroom. And so um, uh, she was just, she was just amazed at how involved or engaged the kids were, were in that lesson. And so that's how it all came about. Well, we'll, uh, we'll link to the article when we talk about you know, when we post this um, podcast episode, but um, what uh, essentially was the article ab about? Was it about uh, your experience combined yeah. with what you do now? Yes. Uh, the article was basically about um, bringing uh, my part of history to the classroom. Um, and so um, it was about how, where I grew up and um, my education and it was about uh, my experience of who inspired me to be a teacher 
Um, and so they got to know a little bit about Mr. Halliburton and um, and just while I was standing before them uh, as a teacher, I said, if it wasn't for um, uh, Dr. King and uh, those, uh, the Brown versus Board of Education, those things, then uh, Rosa Parks, then I wouldn't be standing before you as a teacher today. And so um, had to overcome a lot of um, struggles to get to uh, where we are today in education. And so they just, they were just all ears, all eyes. <laughs> so Yeah. It's a, it's a great article. I'll, and I'll uh, link over to that. Okay. Uh, so do you know uh, what school will be like when you come back in the fall? Uh, we don't know yet. All I am, I am, <laughs> I am so in, in anticipation of getting back. I want to, um, I want to get back and get back into the, uh, some normalcy with, with students. And so I, I, we don't know yet what's going to happen in the fall. And so a lot of them, now that you've been teaching for a while, a lot of your former students, I'm sure have, uh, careers of their own. Have you inspired any teachers that you know of? I, they, I'll tell you, um, there was, there's so many, there's so many, um, my husband had, uh, um, uh, a person to put down a, a carpet uh, on our front porch. He says, my daughter had you, your wife or the teacher. <laughs> she said you were her favorite teacher. And uh, my husband had to go to the doctor this morning. And even the nurses and that, you had my daughter in class. She loved you. Uh -huh. And then <laughs> it just, you wouldn't. And then I see, uh, oh, you just you you wouldn't imagine the feedback I get from students, and then I had this one experience that it was uh, the Dresden High School football team went to a tournament, and then um, I was teaching. And I looked outside my door. The principal had brought all the football players down to my room, and they just wanted to. Oh, it was just so emotional, but. You don't know, you just wouldn't realize the impact that an educator has on a, I mean, you would realize because you have children, but the impact that a teacher would have on kids, and they may not even know it at that time. And then they come back years later and say, oh, you know, I had you in, uh, I was in your class, Miss B, and I loved your class. And you inspired me to be an English teacher, or you inspired me to be a teacher, uh, just a teacher. Um, but it's just, I don't know. I just get so many positives from parents and, and from students that I, former students that I've had in the classroom. I had this one student, um, I teach seventh and eighth grade. So seventh grade, if I don't get them seventh grade, I hope you have, I have you miss next year, Miss B. <laughs> and then this one student said, and she didn't have me. She had another teacher uh, because we have two teachers that teach eighth grade language arts. And she said, but I've been waiting on you for four, <laughs> four <laughs> years. And so I said, I'm sorry. I said, I said you'll be fine. Okay, you're best in the classroom. You can always come down to see me. But yeah. <laughs> well, so my youngest daughter has recently said that she might, you know, she's going to, to college and she's decided that she might want to be an English teacher. So oh, wow. Uh, so I'm going to get her to listen to this. What advice do you have for someone like her who's just starting out in their education? Any, uh, any advice you can pass along? Um, again, the main thing is to get to know your students. Know them individually. Um, all students are not the same. They're not going to learn the same. And so just get to know the students and get the support of the parents. If you got the parents on your side, then uh, your teaching years will be um, be a lot more run smoother. And so um, uh, anyone going into teaching, I would tell them it's the most rewarding career you can ever have. Not how, that. How many uh, students, have you added up how many students you've had in your career? I have not. <laughs> I have not. I just know that there's, I just, I don't know, it's just, it's just 
it's just the most and it I mean you can't get into teaching for the for the money it's not about the money it's about um, the the students and helping them to learn and to be the most successful people that they can be in life I used to tell my students that you know and just and you're not just teaching the students the standards you're teaching them everything I know the parents do that as well but then you, you 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 try to teach them everything that you can make everything a teachable moment for example I used to tell my kids I said be the best you can be where I don't care where you are I don't care and I call Walmart Wally where I said I don't care if you at Walmart <laughs> be the best person you know how to be and then um, and so I try to instill that in my students and to learn, be the, become that intrinsic learner. Uh, always, uh, always be ready to learn something new. And so that's what, that's what I would, uh, for, your, for your daughter, that's my philosophy of education. Every, every student can learn, but uh, you have to get with them on an individual basis and teach to how they learn. Whether it's uh, whether it's some are auditory learners, some are visual learners, some are kinesthetic learners. Uh, so you have to teach all three brain modalities when you teach a lesson to them. Because some learn by watching a movie, some learn by listening, and then some learn by doing. And so we incorporate all those brain modalities into that lesson that you're teaching your kids. But the number one thing is to show students that you love them and you care about them that's the first thing and then everything else will follow <laughs> well i'm i'm almost done with kids but if i had one i might even move to dresden just so i could get <laughs> in <into> class <laughs> and you you wouldn't believe how well i uh, i have trained several um several times for quantum learning i don't know if you heard of quantum learning network sure. Yes. Well, I have trained with them because um, I used to go to Nashville to Trevecca and to train at their workshops. And um, I, this past year, I recently recently spoke uh, uh, to a group of um, educators at UT Martin about the quantum learning and the impact that it has on my students and in my classroom. Um, but even the music kids love music and that's why I incorporate that class song lean on me at the beginning of the school year because they love music and you wouldn't be surprised with the parents that tell me uh well we were going we were driving this to this place and oh lean on me came on the radio and my son or my daughter they could sing that whole song <laughs> and it has significance of it. it's not just a song but it has significance behind it and so yeah, that's amazing. Well, so now um, switch gears slightly. What do you do for fun? For fun? Yeah. What are your hobbies? Uh, I, I read, <laughs> and then my main hobby is watching the NBA. <laughs> I love the NBA. Now, don't ask me who my favorite team is, because I'd have to tell you. <laughs> the, can you guess? It's the Golden State Warriors. Oh, I love wow! Golden State. Now they haven't done so well this season, but um, in the last season I was really on. Uh, oh, they're awesome team, awesome team. Have and you been I, to any of the games in person? I have. I went to um, the. Um, I went to Memphis to the FedEx Forum. To they played um, the Golden State Warriors played uh, played there, and so. That was my only opportunity to get somewhere close to see them play. And the tickets were reasonable, so <laughs> we yeah. went to see them. But that's the first time I got to see Kevin Durant and my favorite player, Steph Curry, <laughs> number 30, <laughs> Clay Thompson. I got to see them all, and I was so excited, so excited. And my, my, my classroom, you can ask them, what's Miss B's favorite team? <laughs> they can tell you Golden State Warriors. Who's the favorite player <laughs> Steph Curry. <laughs> That's awesome. So you really, you really, not only do you get to know the students, they get to know you. They do. They do. They know all about me. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. You're welcome. I appreciate your having me on your, on your podcast. I appreciate that. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. 
Start planning your visit to Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. And also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.